Good morning. I've, I've been given a thumbs up, which should mean I can hear, you definitely can hear me. Um, welcome to this session on Pathways to Pain, How to Cure, Not Cause. Uh, I'm Ewan St. John Smith. I've been told to read out some housekeeping notes before we start, so uh, roaming mics will be supplied for the Q&A session. Um, please wait until you have the mic to ask your question, otherwise you won't be able to hear your question on the recording. Which brings us on to point two, which is, if it wasn't already clear, this event is being recorded both audio and or film, and will be available after the festival. Um, and we'll do our best to address as many audience questions as possible, but we might not have time to answer all of them. So it's not on the notes, but I'll happily linger outside if there are so many questions we can't fit them into the time. Um, so I'm based in the Department of Pharmacology, where I'm a professor of nociception. That's a word some of you might know, some of you might not know. We'll come on to why it says that rather than something else in a few slides' time. Um, I'm in the Department of Pharmacology, which is on Tennis Court Road. It used to be, if you go back in time, up on the real Adambrook site, the modern Adambrook site. And before that, it started off as a hut uh, just outside the physiology uh, lab on the Downing site. Uh, I'm also co-director of Cambridge Neuroscience, which is an initiative that's a virtual hub, bringing together about the 900 neuroscientists we have across all of Cambridge, so from engineering to clinical neurosciences to pharmacology. Um, and then lastly, I'm a, a fellow of Corpus, and I, I have... One doesn't want to sort of blow one's own ego and things, but I think I do have one of the best signatures in Cambridge, which is I'm officially the custodian of the Corpus Coronophage Clock. So when you see that gold <laughs> bit of bling on Bennett Street, it's definitely a bit like Marmite. You either like it or you loathe it. I'm a big fan of it. So if anyone's got any questions about the Coronophage, we can ask them at the end as well. Okay, so pain. Um, if we go back in time, this was sort of pain. This, this uh, sketches from the late 1700s, and we've got a gentleman uh, clearly showing signs of anguish as his leg is being scythed off by these people and other people inspecting, and the only real pain relief um, are people holding on to him. And if we zoom in on this panel up here, um, we perhaps get an indication of what people thought of doctors at the time when we have names such as uh, Launcelot Slash Muscle, uh, Dr. Gleet, uh, and uh, others, and so forth, Cut Gut, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so things have moved on since then. Um, so in this talk, we'll hopefully cover, firstly, uh, what is pain, um, why pain research? I work with humans, but largely we work with animals. Um, we could have a whole hour-long debate about the ethics of using animals in research. If anyone has any questions, I'll happily deal with those. But you could be thinking, OK, I know what pain is, but I also know we have paracetamol, ibuprofen. Why are you working with animals to study pain? So basically, I would try to justify my existence to you. And then we'll finish off with three sort of topics on going in the lab to give you an idea of the sorts of work we're doing. Um, we'll talk a bit about arthritis and how we're trying to go from bedside to bench and back again. Um, a tale of painless delivery, which is deliberately a bit confusing, and there isn't going to be any nudity in this show, but uh, Naked Insights is where we will end. So firstly then, what is pain? Well, if we go back in time... Um, we had some rather good artists, uh, Jans Bruegel the Elder and Peter Paul Rubens, and in the 1600s, they drew the five senses. So here we have the sense of sight. This lady here is surrounded by lots of wonderful things to look at. Now it's the sense of hearing. Um, she's playing a musical instrument. There's a rather jovial band in the background singing. So this is all about hearing. Now she's got a, a, a laden table full of things to eat. So this is then the sense of taste. Now she's outside, uh, and surrounded by lots of flowers, so she's sniffing these, the sense of smell, and then last but no means least, the sense of touch. She's cradling the infant and surrounded by lots of things she can physically interact with. So these then are the five classical senses, and they are important, but there are others that we can also observe if we look more closely at these five paintings. So the same as before, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. If we zoom in on the smell image, um, we can see that the lady is sitting outside naked. Now, this could tell us something about what the artists were thinking, or as a neuroscientist, we could infer it was a hot day, she's in a private garden, her sensory nerves that detect the sense of warmth say, well, it's warm, I don't need to wear clothes in my own garden. So I'm going with that. I think this is just a demonstration of thermoception in the 1600s. If we zoom in on hearing, um, we can see the lady is looking at you, while she's cunningly playing an instrument. This indicates the sense of proprioception. The bits of our body know where they are in relation to each other without us having to physically look at where everything is at the same time. Hence, she can look at you while still playing on her instrument. So now we have seven senses. These, again, are all very important. But the most important one is actually lingering in the image of touch. 
So if we zoom in, she's cradling an infant, but next to her are some instruments used in medical procedures in the 1600s, which I'm sure are sharp, but not the level of sharpness that I would really want if someone was to start cutting into me. So it says here pain, which isn't quite right. We'll come on to that in a minute. But this nonetheless shows that even though we have these five senses, there are other things that are common to how we interact with our world and how our body senses its place in the world. So, pain. A question for the audience, which we won't do because there'll be a roaming mic, so just have a think about it, otherwise it'll be too complicated. Um, what is pain? So usually I'm asking this question quite commonly to uh, students who are visiting Cambridge or Corpus for a, learn a bit about what it might be to study here, and you get lots of interesting answers, but most people do sort of narrow in on ouch, something that's unpleasant, which is fine, it is. But if you're going to study pain, you need to make sure that everybody is talking about the same thing. So I'm part of the International Association for the Study of Pain. There's a really exciting committee, the Taxonomy Committee, where they get to decide what words mean. And they redefined pain in 2020, and this is their rather convoluted definition of pain. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with, or resembling that associated with, actual or potential tissue damage. So we have got the ouch part, an unpleasant sensory experience. Most people wouldn't consider the emotional part. We'll come back to that in a second. But also this rather rambling bit about associated with or resembling that. And really what this takes into account is the previous definition of pain had had this suggestion that it had to be described, which meant that the thing that was feeling this sensation had to be able to speak. So if I pick up a baby, hold it about that height and drop it on the floor, what will happen? It'll cry. Hopefully. It might not. We'll come back to that in a second. So if the baby cries, we would infer that the baby is experiencing pain. But the baby can't tell us it's experiencing pain. It can't articulate. So that's obviously a very silly example. But two more realistic examples are we have an aging population. We have more people living with Alzheimer's disease, for example, who can become nonverbal. If somebody falls out of bed and the x-ray shows they've got a broken femur, they're probably experiencing pain. The fact they can't tell us they're experiencing pain doesn't mean they cannot. So if we think that something looks like pain, it probably is, and we should treat accordingly. And this definition also encompasses non-human animals. I have three cats. I try and work out what they're thinking. I can't really know. But if they're limping, I can infer that they're probably experiencing pain. And we need to contrast pain with another word, which is why I'm a professor not of pain. And that's nociception, which is what I am a professor of. This is a neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. So how can we contrast these two? Well, I have a mug of coffee here, which, because I was standing outside and it's quite cold, um, it's no longer burning hot. But if I got up in the morning, my cup of coffee was too hot, I would go, ouch, and put it down again. That is nociception. The noxious stimulus of the heat switched my nerve on, and I responded. I'm highly unlikely to spend the rest of the day feeling depressed or feel ever more anxious about going near a coffee mug. There's no real emotional component. But if someone is living with a chronic pain syndrome, perhaps osteoarthritis, they might wake up in the morning lying in bed in pain, knowing that getting out of bed is going to cause them pain, and really that walk to the shops or going off to play bingo is just a no-go because of the pain they're going to infer. And then they're not going to be engaging in a normal life, so their quality of life decreases. And that's why if people are living with chronic pain, we can see higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression. So pain, as a clinical state, has both the sensory ouch component but has this often ignored emotional experience. In our lab, we take a view which the brain's rather complicated, um, and pain definitely starts out in the periphery. If you go to a dentist and they do something unpleasant, hopefully first they will inject you with a local anaesthetic. After that point, it doesn't matter whether the dentist is drilling, cutting, burning, you won't feel anything. Nothing will get to the brain. So if we deal with pain in the periphery, we can ignore the complicated bits. And that means ignoring the emotions. And I don't study the brain, therefore I'm not a professor of pain, I'm a professor of nociception. That is a far simplified, oversimplified version of pain. Of course the brain is important, the spinal cord is important. But if we can work out what starts the whole thing off, maybe we don't need to worry about the more complicated bits. So how does pain start off? Well, if you open a textbook, you will see something like this a basic diagram of the sensory nervous system. So over on the left here, we've got some skin, these gray things, these are hairs sticking out, and there are two main sets of sensory nerve fiber. We have mechanoreceptors, shown here in blue. These are involved in the sensation of touch, and nociceptors, shown here in red, which underlie nociception, the sense of pain. 
And if we stimulate one of those nerves, whether it's a mechanoreceptor or a nociceptor, an electrical signal will fly from the periphery all the way to the spinal cord in one go. So it's a single cell, let's say when you stub your toe, from that toe to your spinal cord, it's one cell. The cell body for those nerves is located for your body below the head in something called the dorsal root ganglia. These are sort of two strings of pearls either side of your spinal cord that send out these nerve fibers to the periphery. Now, there are lots of different flavors of nociceptors and mechanoreceptors, but one broad distinction is how they respond to an ongoing stimulus. Hands up if you're wearing socks. Right, most people are wearing socks. It's quite cold. How do you know you're wearing socks? Because the only way you know is, A, you remember putting them on, B, you had a quick look down, or you wriggled your toes. Because your toes are not constantly telling you you're wearing socks, because your brain doesn't need to know you're wearing socks, you're wearing socks, you're wearing socks. <laughs> Mechanoreceptors adapt to an ongoing stimulus. By contrast, again, if my hot mug of coffee was really hot, I don't want to pick it up and go, ouch, that's really pain. Oh, no, actually, it's OK. I don't want my nerve to adapt to the sensation. Meanwhile, I keep burning my hand. So nociceptors will keep firing a signal until you remove the source of stimulation. Whereas mechanoreceptors, they, again, they can work differently. But broadly speaking, they will adapt to a stimulus. You don't need to always know you're wearing socks. So we activate a nerve fiber, a signal flies off the spinal cord, and things get complicated. Most textbooks will show you one nerve going to another one and up to the brain. About 5% of nociceptors do that. The vast majority enter a circuitry of interneurons and things that we're beginning to understand but still don't fully understand. And then some of those signals go up to the brain after processing where it gets even more complicated and we, even, and we understand even less. Which is why, as I said, we in my lab tend to study this bit where it's a single nerve going to the spinal cord. It's much easier circuitry. So the spine and brain are important, but we're going to ignore those. So that's what the textbook looks like. If you're a mouse, it would look like this. So the brain is off the uh, screen over here. The spinal cord's down towards the tail of the animal. And as I said earlier on, these, these DRG, these dorsal root ganglia, which hold the cell bodies for sensory nerves, they're on either side of the spinal cord. And at the bottom here, you've got some skin from the back of the animal. And we've got these nerve fibers connecting the DRG to the peripheral organs. So it's a very organized system. And unfortunately, if anyone in the audience or one of your friends or family members has experienced shingles, the reason that this happens in dermatomes in your body is it will infect one of these sections of the body. So you don't have it randomly scattered. It will be in different sections because your body is organized. So pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Wouldn't life without pain be better? Um, no, it wouldn't. So what's the evidence for that? Well, we can look at this in two ways, and one is to go to the animal kingdom. So what you're looking at here is things, we've got sponges over here on the left, and over here in grey, we've got homo sapiens, that's us. So lots of different organisms, and everything in grey is an organism where nociceptors, sensory nerves underpinning the sensation of pain, or nociffensive behaviours, so behaviour that looks like a pain response, have been observed. This worm here is C. elegans, a nematode worm, it's one millimetre long, You've all probably killed in your lifetimes thousands, if not millions of them, because they live in soil. So if you're washing mud off carrots, you are washing poor little C. elegans down the sink. Now, most C. elegans are hermaphrodites. There's a few males, but we can largely ignore those. The hermaphrodites have 302 nerves. About 24 of those nerves function as nociceptors. So what we might deem a very basic organism has still dedicated a large part of its biology to being able to detect things around it and respond accordingly. Because if you can detect things that might damage you, you can respond and live to reproduce another day. The medicinal leech down here is having a nice blood meal sucking on someone's arm. And leeches move in concertina fashion. And in each segment of that leech, there is a ganglia, just like the dorsal root ganglia in humans. And when we look in those, we can find cells called N cells, nociceptor cells. So the leech like the human, has nerves that are tuned to only respond to stimuli that can cause damage. Up the top here, we have a rainbow trout. Now things get complicated. Fish definitely have nociceptors. Do fish have emotions? Now it gets complicated. So if you stick a human being in an MRI scanner and under consenting times, you've said, I'm going to hurt you, and we look at which bits of the brain get switched on when we start poking with painful things. So it's usually medical students who will volunteer for anything. 
So you can look at which bricks of the brain light up, and we can sort of roughly term this as the pain matrix. This doesn't really exist. There's lots of bits of the brain that are involved in pain, but we can still see certain parts of the brain that seem to be more lighting up when it's a noxious stimulus. Now, fish have quite a complex brain. It's not as complex as that of animals, of mammals, but certain bits of the brain that we know light up in humans when we give them a noxious stimulus exist in fish. And some of those bits are associated with emotional processing. So therefore, do fish have emotions? Do they have the emotional component of pain? This is a big debate in the scientific field. People write articles quite vigorously against each other. As I said, we work on the peripheral nervous system, so we can just watch the argument from the outside. I don't have a personal view. Politically, fish will probably never have emotions because it would impact how we work with fish. So, fish definitely have nociception. Do they have pain? That's another question. I think no one would argue that C. elegans doesn't have emotions. It's got 302 nerves. There is no brain. There's a ring of nerves where things talk to each other, but I think most people would be happy to say no emotions for the C. elegans, probably not for the leech. As for fish, who knows? The key bits, though, is what's down there, bottom left, from Darwin um, in his master work. Um, any variation, however slight, if it be in any degree profitable to an individual, any species, will tend to the preservation of that individual. There's nothing special about being human. So, the animal kingdom shows that no susception is present. Being able to detect what's going on in your environment is important to protect yourself. But we can also see that it's essential for the survival of humans. So this is an image of a boy um, with a condition called congenital insensitivity to pain. So congenital, it's a genetic condition he's been born with. Insensitivity to pain, cannot feel painful things. If we look closely, we can see that he's got no digits, and he's got an ulcerated left knee, and he's having to lean on a ladder to stand up. So what's happened? Well, if you can't feel painful things, you'll end up doing things to your body that you shouldn't really be doing. So if I pick up that hot coffee mug and I can't feel that it's hot, I'll slowly burn my hand and then pour boiling hot liquid down my throat and burn that as well. So unfortunately, injury often leads to infection, infection leads to amputation. Um, these people quite often die quite young due to respiratory problems because they don't have the sensory nerves in their airways that would make them cough in response to things that shouldn't be there. Now, if someone took away your sensation of pain, you've had a lifetime of learning behind you. You would know that if you fall off a bike, even if nothing hurts, you might want to go to the doctor if you're limping in a rather odd way. But trying to watch a two-year-old do things and make sure they're aware of how they're interacting with their surroundings, it's a bit different. So it's not always a fatal condition. There is a family in the UK where both parents are healthy, but all three children have this, and they're now in their 30s. Of course, they've had things go wrong, but they are OK. And it comes in different... Um, there are different forms of this condition. Some are worse than others. Now, this boy has no digits because of various things that have happened, um, but a clinical collaborator of mine in Oxford works with these patients, and he does have um, a patient who has all of his digits, but they're rather bent and at odd angles. And the reason for this, um, the patient explains, is that when he was a toddler, like any young child, he would go into a shop, he'd say, I want that. Mum and dad would go, no. And what do most toddlers do? They'll start shouting, screaming. And he realized the way he could win the argument was to break one of his fingers. Because he couldn't feel it, but mum and dad would you know, give in. There is that Lego set you wanted. So it really is a complete and utter absence of the ability to go, ouch. There are different causes of this. Some are in genes that mean that anatomically you do not have any sensory nerves. So this one here called n track one this is a gene that encodes a receptor for a hormone called nerve growth factor. Lots of hormones have really silly names, have nothing to do with what they really do because they were given a name decades ago and then it was found out they did lots of other things. Nerve growth factor does make nerves grow, so we're good on that. And importantly, it makes nociceptors grow. So if that signaling pathway isn't working during development, those nociceptors retract, you don't have any. So he can feel warmth, cool, touch, but can't feel ouch. There are other genes, such as this one here, SCN9A, that are responsible for enabling your electrical firing in nerve fibers to happen normally. If that's not working, anatomically you've got those nociceptors, but they aren't working. So, pain is unpleasant, but hopefully this demonstrates both from an evolutionary point of view and from a human point of view that it is better to be able to go ouch than not go ouch. But there's another important thing about this system, which is that it is not static. So in this graph here on the y-axis, we've got the pain intensity, how loudly you scream, and on the x-axis, the stimulus intensity. You're all wearing clothes, which is good. 
they are exerting a mechanical stimulus, but you're not in pain, hopefully. So not all stimuli cause pain, but at some point, the stimulus intensity is great enough, you'll start to scream ever louder. And remember, that is a good thing to protect your body. But if you injure yourself, things change. Everything shifts to the left. And two key words are involved to describe what happens. Allodynia is where uh, stimuli that used to cause no pain now do. Hyperalgesia, stimuli that used to cause some pain now cause much more pain. So for those of you that may have experienced sunburn at some point in your life, um, especially men who might have worn a collar, that collar starts causing you mechanical pain, even though the day before it didn't. The shower that was pleasantly warm is now burning hot. This shift in pain sensitivity is a good thing. If you've injured part of your body and it hurts a bit more, you'll look after it. That will mean that hopefully you won't injure it again. It will heal more rapidly and you'll be back to normal more quickly. So depending on the severity of the injury, you'll shift ever further to the left. And then if things go to plan, it will shift back to the blue curve. A lot of painkillers that people take for sort of everyday bumps and things like ibuprofen, all they're really doing is they're switching off the ability of certain chemicals that cause the blue to red shift to happen, and so you go slowly back to blue. They're stopping that shift happening. We have a lot of people living with chronic pain where they've gone from blue to red and got stuck. So we're trying to largely in our lab work out what drives them to go from blue to red and how can we get them back again? Because we don't want to switch off pain. Unless you're undergoing surgery, where you really don't want to feel what's going on, you need to feel pain. So giving somebody a drug to completely switch people's pain sensation off is not a good thing. And just to demonstrate the importance of this extra sensitivity in the system, we can again look at different species. So in this diagram here, we've got a fish that is a fish that likes to eat squid. And people did some experiments where they took normal squid, squid which had had an arm tip amputated, and then those had the same amputation done, but under anesthesia. So you've got three groups, healthy, happy squid, injured squid, and injured squid that were injured during anesthesia. So this red squid here has this increased sensitivity. The one with anesthesia, it was under anesthesia when the amputation happened. We have prevented that blue to red curve shift happening. And what we're looking at in this graph on the y-axis is the percent survival if we have this fish for 30 minutes with the squid. So uninjured ones, most of them will survive. They're pretty good at swimming away. If you put a normal squid in anesthetic for a while, it doesn't really do anything. This third bar is where they're injured animals. So they've been injured. They've had that sensitization of that injured limb. And that fourth group, they've been injured, but the sensitization has been prevented by using an anesthetic. And you can see that this final group have a much lower chance of surviving than those that had the injury, and the sensitization process. So obviously being uninjured is better than being injured, but if you are injured permanently, like in an amputated state, you get this hypervigilance, this extra sensitivity in the system will alter your behavior. And in the case of the squid, this leads to an increased chance of survival. As demonstrated by preventing this sensitization with anesthesia, you have a much lower chance of surviving. You can do similar studies or observe similar studies with other animals. So if um, if we have uh, rodents where we give them a neuropathic pain injury and we don't expose them to a fox because that would be unethical by a long way, but you can expose mice to fox urine and look at their response. And an animal that is having a, a, a neuropathic pain syndrome, it's got this sensitization, will show an increased avoidance. So basically it's aware of the fact it can't act normally, it needs to act a bit differently. And then very hypothetically, we have no evidence for this, but an idea would be that why do humans have this? Well, again, if we go back in time and we're being chased by lots of bigger beasts, if you had some chronic pain syndrome going on that was driving an increased sensitivity, you would start running a lot quicker than your friends because you know you're less able to survive because of whatever injury you have. So although this change in the pain system might seem odd, we can look through different organisms through the evolutionary world and see that actually it's quite common and certainly where we can do nice controlled experiments, we can see it does increase the chance of survival. Okay, so that's a bit about what pain is. Uh, now I need to justify my existence to you, and then the final few minutes before questions, we'll look at three sort of examples from the lab. So, is there a high prevalence of chronic pain in adults? Because if our lab's going to study pain, we need to work with rodents, we're going to make them experience pain, that is a, a, a big thing that we're doing, we need to justify that. So, a question for the audience. What is the prevalence of chronic pain in the UK? 
So chronic pain can be defined in different ways. In this study, it was defined as chronic pain in more than one body location lasting more than three months. And you've got four options. So it could be under 5%, 22%, 43%, or 64%. So can people put their hands up if you think it is under 5% of the UK adult population experience chronic pain? Few optimists. 22%. 43%. Sixty-four percent. So just for the recording, we had a couple of optimists at under five, a few very strong pessimists at 64, most people somewhere in the middle. It's 43 percent. So this is an analysis of lots of, of lots of studies taken together. On average, it's 43 percent, which seems really high. But we need to remember that's not 43 percent for sort of every age group. Unfortunately, and this is a slide that goes down much better with 16-year-olds than a, a more senior audience. Um, <laughs> As you get older, things get worse. So usually I'm showing this slide to, say, undergraduate medical students. I'm saying, you're over here in this group here. You're 16 to 34 years old. Chronic pain is rare. But as you get older, chronic pain becomes more common, usually because conditions that can cause pain are more common as you get older. So this is brilliant as a pain scientist. Lots of people are suffering. <laughs> Next question. What's the most common cause of chronic pain? Are these data from a study in Europe? So we've got traumatic injuries, so maybe that's a ski accident, herniated disc, that's the discs in the spinal cord, uh, migraine, and then arthritis, osteoarthritis. So hands up if you think that traumatic injury is the most common cause of chronic pain in Europe. A couple of people. Herniated discs. A couple more people. Migraine. A couple more people. Arthritis, osteoarthritis. Hurrah. <laughs> So, these data show that a third of chronic pain patients have that chronic pain due to arthritis, osteoarthritis. This particular study is from 2006. Guaranteed that number is nearer 40% for reasons we'll come on to later. So, we've got lots of people suffering, but we have painkillers. So, what's the problem? Give these people who are suffering painkillers. Okay. So, if we ask those chronic pain patients... Is your pain medication adequate? Not if it's perfect, just is it all right? So were 91% of chronic pain patients happy, 72, 36, or 18? Hands up, please. 91%. No real optimists. 72. Few people. 36. 18. Okay, I've driven you into a sense of being too pessimistic. It's 36. <laughs> So, the blue bit is the important bit. Two-thirds of chronic pain patients say their pain medication is inadequate. Two main reasons. One, you're popping pills, your pain is still there, no one wants to take drugs for fun. Well, not usually. <laughs> or, you do take it, it's better for the pain, but the side effects are so bad, you'd rather just deal with the pain. Now, I'm a pharmacologist, I'm talking about drugs, there are lots of other ways that people can manage their pain. A big thing that a lot of people have difficulty with, but definitely works, in most cases, is physical exercise. For most musculoskeletal problems, if you don't do exercise, as your musculoskeletal system gets weaker, your pain can get worse as you're less able to do things. But of course, if doing things causes you pain, it's a complicated situation. So again, as a pain scientist, this, this is brilliant. We've got loads of people suffering and the drugs don't work. So to write the first two or three sentences of your grant application is quite easy. doesn't mean you'll get the money, but at least you've, you've hooked people. The next one is that pain is only a sensation because, again, to a young audience, people generally think, ouch, you take a painkiller, it goes away. And we recently did a large study um, published earlier this year looking at chronic pain in humans and asking one of the questions about how it affects their life. Now, you might struggle to read some of these things, so I'll just walk you through this graph. So what we did is we asked people questions, and in green, it means they strongly agreed with the statement, and in red, they disagreed. Um, and so if we look at this uh, penultimate one here, my pain has a negative effect on my sleep quality. Virtually everybody is agreeing with this, which is a big problem because we know that poor quality sleep has impacts on lots of other health issues. If we just pick another one out here, uh, my pain status has prevented me from engaging in non-physical recreational activities, reading, watching TV. Again, a good chunk of people say yes. So pain is not just ouch. Pain has a major impact on an individual to engage in a normal life, which can have impact in terms of mental health conditions they may develop. Now, let's say that you couldn't care less about the individual. For you, it's all about the economy. Well, this is also important because if we have a lot of people who are not able to engage in a normal life, they are not contributing to the economy of your country. So there are lots of studies looking at the impact of chronic pain on GDP in different countries. 
In the UK alone, rheumatoid arthritis, which affects about 1% of the population, costs the UK economy £8 billion a year. That's direct healthcare costs, indirect activity of people not being able to engage with work and so on and so forth. So whether you care about the individual, which hopefully you do, but if you don't, you just care about the bigger picture, chronic pain has a massive impact on how the world works. So it's common, drugs don't work, and it's not just a sensation. Grant application written, now let's get some money. So we've got the money because we've justified ourselves, and what we'll do in the final few minutes is walk through some things that are going on in the lab. And we'll begin by talking about um, some work we were doing recently, um, looking at arthritis pain. So you've seen this diagram before. How does the pain system work? We've got our sensory nerves innervating a peripheral organ. In this case, it's the skin. Um, but if we're talking about arthritis, of course, we're talking about knee joints, hip joints, finger joints, wherever it might be. Now, it's really difficult to study how the endings of nerves work because they're embedded in fat, bone, muscle, skin. Very difficult. But we have a slight way around this because the only way that the end of the nerve can work is because the end of that nerve is making molecules that enable it to interact with whatever stimuli come along. And those molecules only get to the end of the nerve because the cell body located in the dorsal root ganglia has made them and they get sent down the nerve fiber to the end of the nerve. Now we can easily isolate these dorsal root ganglia. You saw in that image earlier on with the spinal cord and there's two strings of pearls. So we can isolate these from animals and we can study individual nerves. Now, it is not a perfect simulation of what happens at the nerve ending, but we know the properties of the cell body replicate what the nerve ending can do. So that's a model. So we're interested in pain in the knee joint. So we've got a knee that's obviously in pain. We've got our sensory nerve going to the knee. And now I've given you a bit more of the diagram. Here we've got our dorsal root ganglia that we've been talking about. It goes into the spinal cord, lots of pluses and negatives as nerves either have impacts on each other. Then it goes up to the brain and it all gets complicated. So we're going to ignore those bits and focus on the knee. The question is, how do you study nerves innovating the knee? So we have techniques of being able to do this. Our, our model of choice is usually the mouse. The reason for this is that we can genetically modify the mouse. So if we find something exciting about a particular molecule, we can then perhaps make a mouse that doesn't have that molecule and see what happens to the pain syndrome. So we can take the mouse and under anesthesia, we can inject a fluorescent dye into the knee joint. And this dye gets taken up by sensory nerves and goes back to the dorsal root ganglia. Because if you're looking at the whole dorsal root ganglia, there will be cells going to every part of that body. So if you take a DRG, let's say, in the top part of your thorax, there'll be nerves going off to the skin, the muscle, the bone, the joints of that segment. Now, if you think about it, whenever you've hurt yourself during your lives, your skin's really sensitive. You know exactly where a stimulus has landed. Whereas if you've got pain inside your body, it's a bit more vague. You know, it's kind of there-ish. And one of the reasons for that is your skin has many more nerves innervating it than your internal organs, which again makes a lot of sense because your skin will be the first thing that comes into contact with that potentially damaging stimulus. So if we want to study the nerves that go to the knee, we need to identify them because maybe their properties will be different from those going to the skin. And that's how we can do this. This fluorescent label will identify the nerves. And just to show what the sort of needle in a haystack way we have to do this is, on the left here, we have a section through a dorsal root ganglia, which looks hopefully a bit like this. You've got the, the round parts containing all the cells, and on the left, you've got these nerve fibers coming in, just like in the diagram over here. This ganglia has come from a mouse in which we've injected this dye. If we switch on a certain wavelength light, we can excite the nerves, and you can see these blue cells, they are cells that went to the knee joint. And you can see there's a lot of black space. Most nerves in a DRG are not going to the knee. They're going to the skin. They're going to other tissues. So using this method, we're able to study the properties of nerves specifically going to the knee joint, which, if we want to study arthritis pain, is important. Why do we care about osteoarthritis in particular? Over here, we can see the aging population over time. So we've got older, it's 100 plus at the top, naught down here. And you can see that this pyramid becomes ever less pyramid-like over time and we're getting a lot more people living older, which is great. People are living, hopefully, longer, healthier lives. But on the left, we've got the sort of demographics, as it were, of osteoarthritis. Women in pink, males in blue. As you get older, the chance of getting osteoarthritis increases. There's about 500 million people at the moment with osteoarthritis globally. By 2050, because of this aging population, it's estimated to be 1 billion. 
and we have no way of treating osteoarthritis that is specific. We know that peripheral sensitization is important, so that change in sensitivity of the nerves going to the peripheral parts. Yes, there are changes that happen in the spinal cord and brain, but the knee damage changes activity of nerves in the knee. Nerve growth factor, that hormone I mentioned earlier, that if things go wrong in its signaling pathway, you can get congenital insensitivity to pain. It's a bit odd. It doesn't just make nerves grow. If you inject people with nerve growth factor, you will cause their pain sensitivity to increase. And we know that you have increased levels of NGF in conditions such as osteoarthritis. And there was so much excitement and interest in NGF as a target for treating osteoarthritis that pharmaceutical companies spent a long time studying drugs that could switch NGF signaling off. But unfortunately, after 39 trials across 16 years, the FDA and the EMA rejected tanezumab, this drug that would basically hoover up all the NGF in the body. And the reason for this is that it looks like having a bit of NGF is good. If you take it all away, some people are getting rapidly progressing osteoarthritis, so it made their disease worse. So the drug did work for decreasing pain, but there was too big a risk for certain people that they would get worse. So, bad luck for humans. However, lots of research that goes on in labs can help other species, and dogs and cats often get osteoarthritis, and they do have drugs. So in the same year that we were rejected as humans, um, a company in the US, Zoetis, they licensed a drug that targets exactly the same signaling pathway for treating cats and a different one for treating dogs. So cats and dogs with osteoarthritis have more targeted therapy than humans, which is unfortunate. But in our lab, our general belief is a greater understanding of what drives pain at the mechanistic level is required for developing new therapeutics. So if we want to develop new therapeutics, we want to understand the disease biology. I'm not expecting to see all of this diagram. We're just going to zoom in a bit on osteoarthritis. This is what sort of goes wrong. Your bone gets chewed up. You get a bit of inflammation. If we zoom in on that, we've got lots of different cell types in the immune system that start getting to the knee joint. They spit out lots of chemicals which can activate nerves, break down the, the bones. Your bones start growing in a weird way. People generally think of osteoarthritis of bones breaking down, which they do but you're trying to repair at the same time, but it doesn't repair properly. So you get these things called osteophytes, where your bone starts growing out into the joint. If we zoom in again, we've got the ending of our nerve being attacked by all these different cells, these different chemicals, and the idea is, can we work out which of these chemicals, which of these cells is particularly important in driving pain? And one type that we tend to look at a lot is this thing called the synovial fibroblast, which is a bit of a boring cell because fibroblasts just sit there lining the joint. They're not a magical immune cell that leaps in and releases things. But they're there all the time, and they're releasing synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is usually good. It means your joints are lubricated and they move properly as they should. But during a disease, lots of different substances are going to be released into that synovial fluid that wouldn't usually be there. So patients with osteoarthritis have swollen knee joints because they've got too much synovial fluid. Quite often, they'll have their synovial fluid taken out as part of their therapeutic regimen, and they might have a steroid injected in to decrease inflammation. Synovial fluid must contain things that cause pain because we know that osteoarthritis is painful. So Sam, who is a former PhD student in the lab, now doing a, a postdoc in Germany, she teamed up with the rheumatology clinic here, and we said, look, when you take the synovial fluid from patients out, rather than putting it in the bin, can we get them consent to us analyzing it? What's in it, and can we study it on nerves. So what Sam did is she took the synovial fluid and then with her mouse model, she's identified the knee neurons. We can put an electrode inside this knee innervating neuron. So again, we've got a blue nerve here. We know this one went to the knee joint, whereas these others here did not. And what we did is we tried to simulate the osteoarthritis joint. We took the synovial fluid out at a dilution, incubated the nerves overnight, and just measured, do their properties change? Does the synovial fluid from people in pain change the properties of nerves? And the answer was yes. On the left in black, we're switching a nerve on by injecting a small amount of current in steps. And eventually it goes bang, and that would be your out signal. For the cells we incubated with the synovial fluid, we don't have to inject as much current. They're much easier to switch on, which again, thinks that blue and red curve from earlier on, we're switching the sensitivity. It becomes easier to switch the pain signal on. 
And what we're currently doing in the lab is we're trying to take better phenotyped patients so we know what stage of disease they're at, uh, what medications they're on, and trying to identify specific mediators in the synovial fluid of patients at different time points to try and work out what are the chemicals that cause this shift to happen. Can we identify a novel therapeutic agent? The second thing I want to tell you about is a tale of painless delivery, which is sometimes a bit of a struggle to explain to people as a man. So, I've told you that we've got congenital insensitivity to pain, and this can be caused by genetic mutations. This gene was one I told you earlier that encodes a protein enabling electrical activity to flow through nerves. And unfortunately, this gene can be mutated in lots of different ways. Some people end up with no pain, but it also is responsible for a condition called familial primary erythromyalgia, which is a dominantly inherited neuropathy. Essentially, if you get it, you're in pain. You get a burning redness of the extremities. I think you can look at this and go, ouch. And again, it's the same gene. It's been mutated in a different way. Rather than being silent, it's now getting switched on far too easily. So genes can control pain in two different ways. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to try and identify if new genetic pain variants could be identified by studying painless labour. Now, if when I introduce this topic to most women, they'll laugh at you because painless labour doesn't exist. But it does. If you speak to enough people who work in Obs and Gynae, they'll say, no, no, there are some women who you remove all cultural, religious, whatever reasons. They say, well, it didn't hurt. It was painful, but I, I didn't need any painkillers. So what we did with a big team of people, uh, led by this man here, Jeff Woods, at the uh, clinical school here in Cambridge, is several different maternity wards across the UK. We asked them, look, we want people who reported no pain, didn't request analgesics, or otherwise healthy. So we had this list of people who agreed to be contacted, and we said, great, will you come to the clinic so we can try and hurt you, and can we take some of your DNA? And fewer people said yes, but we did get people coming along. So in these graphs... At the top, we're looking at your ability to detect cold, warm, and pressure. Not ouch, just your thresholds. Oh, that's warm. And at the bottom, we're looking at the pain for cold, for heat, for pressure. On the left-hand side in all these graphs, in the open circles, these are our healthy women who've got nothing to do with the study. There's healthy control subjects. In black, we've got women who had said, labor didn't cause me pain that required pain relief. And if we look at these three bottom graphs we can see their cold pain threshold is significantly lower. You have to go to colder temperatures before they go out. It's not a big shift, but it's a shift. Same for heat, has to be a bit hotter. And for pressure pain, a much bigger shift. So these women, most of them, didn't know they had a high pain threshold. A couple of them said, oh yeah, friends have always said I've got a high pain threshold. But it wasn't as if they said, oh, I'm impervious to pain, I'm not surprised by these data. So what it looked like was that these women in black and these three red triangles had something going on at the biological level, because we'd ruled out you know, cultural, psychological reasons as much as we could, that shifted their pain sensitivity. So if you can identify the gene that causes this shift, could we go back to other people and use drugs that target that same gene to change their pain sensitivity? So these black and red people weren't all the same. The three red triangles were people who had the same mutations. We studied them first, because we could see, well, look, three of them, that's far more common statistically than it should be. And those three people had a gene called KCNG, which encodes what we call an ion channel. Now, ion channels are essentially molecules that sit in cell membranes, and they control how that nerve gets switched on or not, how they send electrical signals. And they function a bit like lock gates in a river. So they're stuck, you open them, ions flow in rather than water, and the nerve can get switched on or switched off. Oops. And so, again, back to the dentist, if you take a local anesthetic, it blocks ion channels prevents nerves firing. And KCNG is a bit of a different ion channel. And just to show you one piece of data, this is sort of what it does. We've taken nerves from a mouse. And we've made them express the normal version at the top here or the version from these women at the bottom here. And what we're doing is we're injecting current into the cell to switch it on. The normal version we switch on at this level. We have to inject much more current to make the one with this variant get switched on. And that's summarized over on the left here. So on the left, we've got the uh, version of the ion channel that causes a higher pain threshold in women. It causes these nerves to also have a higher threshold. So again, these nerves are not impossible to switch on. This isn't congenital insensitivity to pain. We've shifted the threshold. So we've got women who've got a variation in a gene who have a higher pain threshold. We can show that this gene can change the properties of mouse neurons to shift the pain threshold. And now we're looking at trying to develop drugs that could target this particular gene. 
And as, at the end of this study, um, because it's linked up basic science, clinical science, genetics, we were quite lucky to be awarded a, a large grant from the Medical Research Council, again, led by that man I mentioned earlier, Jeff Woods. This links up UCL Kings, Edinburgh, and Cambridge. We are studying multiple visceral pain um, uh, morbidities, so inflammatory bowel disease, endometriosis, pelvic pain of different types, bladder pain, polycystic kidney disease. We're doing a lot of phenotyping of patients, genotyping of patients. Can we find weird genes that explain different levels of pain in the same physical presentation? Can we then try and target some of those genes to modify pain sensations? So it's early days, but we're, we're getting there. All right, there will be time for questions. A couple more minutes, because I can't give a talk without mentioning this beast. This is the naked mole rat, and most people in Cambridge who know me will know me as the naked mole rat man, even though it's about 2% of our research. So these are basically similarly sized mice, similarly sized to mice rather than rats. Um, they're subterranean rodents, they live underground, apart from in one David Attenborough documentary. The people who work with them have never seen them above ground. That was filmed at Queen Mary University rather than in the wild. In the wild, they live in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. They're huge social. They have a queen who dominates the colony, usually of 100 animals, up to 300. She's the only breeding female. If you're a diehard zoologist, you'd say they're not eusocial because a queen bee is physically born queen and you can't become queen. Whereas in the mole rat world, it's a bit more like medieval European monarchies. The queen's in charge, she's doing a good job, good, but if another queen wants to have a go, they'll fight to the death, kill off the queen, and the inbreeding will continue. So <laughs> medieval monarchies, mole rats, there are similarities. They're poikilothermic, they're cold-blooded, which is weird, apart from if you've evolved underground in Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, where the difference in temperature between night and day, summer, winter, is two degrees. Live for over 35 years. Same size as a mouse. Mouse lives for two years if you look after it really well in an animal facility. Mole rats, the record holder, 39 years. Uh, we'll see him in a second. And no age-related increase in death as you get older, which is a bit odd. So this is me, just pre-pandemic, 38 grey hair wrinkles, holding a 37-year-old mole rat who did make it, he, he, he did make it till 39, so I have out outlived this guy, but he is the oldest known mole rat, um, and I can tell he looks old, but most people can't. It's very difficult to age a mole rat by appearance alone. This is what makes them special. You've got here how big you are, how long you live. There's a good correlation. Elephants live longer than mice. HS, homo sapiens, that's us. We live for longer than we should. HG, heterocephalus glaber, which means hetero different cephalus head glaber bald. So when they were discovered, they were identified as a different headed bald thing, which is fair enough. <laughs> so why am I telling you about these in terms of pain? Well, I'm just going to whiz through a few things to say that they're basically very odd. Um, so we originally showed that they respond normally to mechanical and thermal stimuli. If we compare them to mice, we're looking at their ability to respond to a stimulus. Capsaicin, the substance in chili peppers that makes them taste hot. Mole rats don't care if they get it in their skin. Mice will lick it. Acid, again, they didn't care. NGF is a substance I've mentioned to you before, nerve growth factor. If you put it into a mouse, it will make their behavior change, become more sensitive. The mole rat couldn't care less. So you've got these weird behaviors in a weird animal. But you can understand what's going on. We're able to identify a genetic basis for the acid insensitivity. We're able to identify that this track A, the same gene that's mutated in some humans with congenital insensitivity to pain, is altered in the mole rat. So you've got an extremophile animal. We can understand what's weird about its pain. Can we then track those genes to try and target pain in humans? One that I'm particularly interested in, we're just about to start working on this, is a group just last year showed they seem to be resistant to osteoarthritis. Imagine that. You live forever, as the mole rat does, and you don't get osteoarthritis. So we're beginning to try and work out how does that happen. And then lastly, mole rats are not just weird for pain. They're just bizarre. They very rarely get cancer. So we've done some work on this, looking at um, how basically their immune system functions a bit differently. Um, they also can survive without oxygen for almost 20 minutes. They just sort of go into a stasis and then wake up. And this all to is that they can use this fructose-driven glycolysis, which we don't have time to talk about, but essentially they have ways of producing energy when you've got no oxygen there. So our brain cells start dying, and the mole rat just sort of goes into stasis, and then boom, comes back to life when oxygen reappears. And we're studying this not just in terms of neuroprotective agents for stroke, but also lots of neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. They're associated with low-level hypoxia, and the mole rat couldn't care less about 0%, let alone a small drop in oxygen. All right, I've witted longer than I wanted to, so we'll just whiz through a conclusion. Hopefully I've convinced you that no perception and pain are good for you, um, but sometimes things go wrong, and chronic pain is a massive issue and poorly treated. We try to understand how pain works in order to identify new therapies, 
Um, we use human samples, be that synovial fluid that was going to go in the BIM anyway, or identifying the genetic base of the variability of pain. Lots of people experiencing chronic pain, they're probably one of the bigger patient groups that will go, yes, I consent, because they've been suffering. They want to try and help, if not them, the next people who have this condition. And we can't do this work without the patients helping us out. So a massive thanks always to them. And of course, if we study extremophile animals like my naked mole rats, who knows what we might be able to solve both for pain and for other things. Um, I largely spend my day emailing. These are the guys who actually do all the work in the lab and people who've done it in the past. Lots of important collaborators and lots of very nice people who've given us money over the years to fund our research. So thank you very much. We have about eight minutes for questions. If you have a question, then hands up and someone will come to you with a microphone. So our first question over there, please. Um, so you've taken us through um, the variations and complexities of pain that has a physiological cause. Can you say something about non-medically explained pain, how frequent that is, how common it is, and how that might be treated or, and how it works? Um, not with any authority is the honest answer. Um, so. When I was doing my PhD, we, we didn't really care about the brain and non-biological sort of biological base of things, but there's definitely been a big, big shift. So I mentioned this visceral pain consortium, and a big part of that is we have a psychological team which are based at UCL. And so they've done a, they're currently undergoing a lot of um, in Q&A, looking at how to study pain, what people find effective works for them. But again, that's usually people who are suffering from a, a physical born pain. Um, in terms of pain that doesn't have a physical basis, it's really not an area that I could comment on with any great authority, I'm afraid. As I said, we study the peripheral nervous system to avoid the complexities of the brain, but it's a question I often get, so I probably should do some more reading on it. So, sorry. Uh, gentleman at the back there. Hi, sorry, just a quick question about the knee. Um, you showed us a great cross-section with all sorts of stuff going on inside it. If you were to reduce the uh, pain receptors so that it hurt less, would it in any way prolong the life of the knee itself, or would the knee just continue to degenerate in the same way? And I think also coupled with that, if we take away the pain, will someone start damaging themselves and so the disease gets worse? So this is why it's important for most people who've got, let's say, osteoarthritis, the pain is what drives the clinical decision making and affects their everyday life. So depending on which mediators we remove, there's a good chance with some of them, you might affect the pain and the actual pathobiology that's going on, which would be brilliant. We'd have a disease-modifying therapy. So for example, for rheumatoid arthritis, we have disease-modifying anti-rheumatic agents, which have transformed the way that rheumatoid arthritis works. The hope is we can understand similar biology in osteoarthritis, so we could attack pain and the disease biology at the same time. But those two things might be different. So from our point of view, we're primarily focused on pain as our readouts, both in patients and with our rodent models. But obviously, the hope is that if you really find something that's important, you'll affect both the disease progression and the pain that's going alongside. So I think it will depend a lot on the cell type you attack or the molecule you focus on. Could you say a little about the social problem of addiction to painkillers? Um, does your work touch on that? Uh, how does it arise and how can it be counted? So we don't work so much on it. It's a much bigger thing that US collaborators do because obviously the, the opioid crisis in North America hasn't to the same extent come to the UK, largely because of how, uh, how we deal with pain and how you can have access to painkillers. Uh, the big problem is that opioids are addictive and you often need a greater dose over time to have your pain relief, um, and so the addiction route is, is a whole thing on its own. There are people trying to uh, understand if there's anything specific about opioid addiction versus other addiction, but in the US, their major drive for funding is for non-addictive painkillers. The last thing we want to do is identify a painkiller that works but causes all the same issues that opioids do. And I think the, the major, I mean, opioids are amazing painkillers. If you wake up from surgery, you want to be pressing that button for morphine. They're brilliant for short-term pain relief. They are amazing drugs but they have all sorts of problems with long-term use, and not just the addiction. Um, you know, a very common side effect is constipation, which sounds funny, but if you've got a bowel problem for which you're taking pain relief, you don't want a drug that's going to worsen your bowel problem. So opioids have multiple different problems, but they are amazing drugs for certain um, places. And I think part of the, the way of trying to go about avoiding the opioid problem is 
to target the peripheral nervous system. Because the reason opioids have problems is because of things they do in the brain in terms of addiction and respiratory depression. So if we try to focus on what happens in the peripheral nervous system, hopefully we can identify a drug target that won't be associated, hasn't got the potential for the addictive nature of opioids and certain other chemicals. Towards the end of your talk, you said something about people's chronic conditions uh, being associated with low levels of hypoxia. Could you say a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's not chronic pain conditions. It's certain... Well, hypoxia exists in any place where you have decreased blood flow. So if someone has osteoarthritis and you've suddenly got this huge amount of fluid in the, in the knee joint, you can have hypoxia there. But it's, it's not a major contributor to pain. What we observe in neurodegenerative conditions, so Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, is that you have neuroinflammation. In the old days, we didn't think the immune system was really doing very much in the brain. We now know the immune system is doing a lot to do with both depression and neurodegenerative conditions. And it's been observed you have low levels of hypoxia, so not sort of huge plummets in oxygen, but a slight change in the microenvironment, which can have knock-on effects for how the immune system is functioning, might become more aggressive, but also changes in oxygen can affect how ion channels, those crucial molecules that regulate neural activity, how they function. So for example, um, when you were all babies in the womb, you had a particular version of an ion channel that gets switched off by hypoxia. That ion channel usually lets lots of calcium into cells, which can be quite dangerous if it's uncontrolled. In the womb, it's relatively hypoxic to being here. After you've been born, this ion channel variant disappears because we don't want to be, we don't need to be hypoxia resistant as, as adults. So we have got sort of an evolutionary point of view. Bits of your brain change to deal with different environments. Um, but the neurodegenerative conditions generally happen in, on average in old age. And we haven't been around long enough as a species to evolve to deal with problems of old age because evolution is great for dealing with problems up until the point you've reproduced. But from an evolutionary point of view, you're not, who cares if you're really old? You're not reproducing anymore. We don't have the same selection pressure for dealing with those issues. So we haven't got as much data yet on how that hypoxia is really driving the condition. But because the mole rats can deal with low levels of, of oxygen without the brain having any issues at all, by comparing the mouse brain, which like the human brain is really susceptible to changes, and the mole rats that isn't, if we can find those differences, can we identify a neuroprotective strategy? So that's the aim. Okay, I think we're I'm getting a signal from the back. We've got to stop. I'm sorry. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm happy sort of lingering out there for a few minutes if people have any other questions. Thank you.